Hi, I'm Adam. Welcome back to Godot Game Lab. Let me show you what we'll do in Season 2. So you can see that if I run the game, we are graded by a brand new main menu. Here we have two options. We can either continue the run we currently have, or start a new one. You can see that the continue option is disabled here, however, because I have no run going on currently. So why don't we go ahead and start a new one? So if I click on this new run button, we are greeted with a character selector screen where we can switch between the different kinds of characters we have. So if I click on this staff icon here, you can see that the character portrait, the name and the description gets updated immediately. And we can also pick the assassin, but why don't we just go ahead and start a new run with the warrior character we have. So I click on start and you can see that we transitioned into this map we have, which is generated in the style of Slade Aspire. And we also have this new top action bar here, where we can see the current health of our character, the gold we have, the relics we currently possess, and the starting deck or the current deck we have in this run. So if I click on this relic, we can get this little description. This is the Endless Healing Potion, which heals you for six HP at the end of every combat. Cool. And also we can view our deck, this is a brand new screen called the card pile view, which we can reuse not just here, but for viewing the draw pile and the discard pile as well. So here you can see that I have a deck of 12 cards and I can click on these cards to get their tooltip or their description of what they do. And we have two brand new cards here, which we'll come back to later. The map itself is very similar in style to what we have in Slade Aspire. We have this little highlights showing which path we can take or which battle we can take in this case. And with the mouse scroll wheel, we can scroll up and down. You can see that we have the boss fight at the end. We have the treasure rooms with the relics. We also have campfires to heal. We have shops to buy new equipment and cards and so on. So if I click on one of these battles, we are greeted with a very familiar screen, right? However, there are some differences. We have two new buttons here. Uh, this is called the draw pile, where we can see all the cards we have. And in similar fashion to Slay the Spire, these cards are not in order by default, right? They, these are randomized. And we also have the discard pile on the right side, which is currently empty. But if I start playing cards, like this AOE card, you can see that I have one card in my discard pile. Cool. So I can kill one of these enemies and my turn here. And the game itself works pretty similar to what we had in the previous state at the end of season one. But let's see what's new here. If I kill one of these bats, you can see that my relic has activated and healed me back to 33 HP. We have the Victoria screen just like we had before, but if I click on awesome, we go to this battle reward where we can collect the rewards we have for our battle. So if I click on the gold, the gold gets added to my current gold and we can optionally add a new card to our deck. Again, we can click on these cards to see what they do and click on this take button if we want to add it to our deck or we can decide to skip the battle rewards just like in State Aspire. By the way, these are not the same cards according to the game, so you cannot see one card more than once in the battle reward. I just didn't take the time to create like 50 different cards. So I added the same card again and again as different cards, but the system itself knows that a card shouldn't appear more than once in a card reward screen. Let's just take this one and you can see that the rewards are empty. I click on continue and we go back to the map. And right here in the map, we only have one place we can go and we have this little circle or pentagon in this case to indicate that this battle is already finished. So we can go to the shop next. Here we can buy cards and relics. Um, we have the card previews again so you can see what a card does before you buy it. And you can do the same with relics. So you can click on the relics, you can see what they do. Right now I don't have much money but we can buy a new card. So if I click on this one, you, you see that the gold gets subtracted. And also if I click on this deck icon, you can see that we have two new cards added in our deck and this is in order. So we had the 12 cards here. We added this blue one as a card reward and also added this defend card from the shop. 
Cool. Another thing I wanted to show you is how we can save and load the game, the current run. So if I press escape here, you can see that I go to a pause menu and we can go back to the main menu from here. So if we go back, this continue button is no longer disabled. I can click on it to continue this previous run. So if I click on this, we go back to the shop, right? So it's like we didn't spend our money. But if you take a look at all the items, you can see that we also have a seed system going from the random generated stuff because we actually have the same items as we had before with the same prices too. So our save system takes care of uh, saving the random generators state and seed as well. So I can buy this defense card again and leave the shop and continue with my path forward. And after continuing, another cool new feature I can show you is status effects. So you can see that I have this card here which says deal 3 damage and apply to exposed. So exposed is like vulnerable in Slay the Spire. If I go ahead and play this, we can see that there's an X appearing under this crab enemy with the number 2. So if I click on this, we get this tooltip which says that exposed enemies take 50% more damage for 2 turns. Currently 2 turns, right? So if I play this attack card, it deals 6 damage by default, but if I hover over this enemy, you can see that the tooltip updates to 9 damage because adding 50% on top of the base damage is equal to 9 damage in this case. So if I play this, you can see that this crab goes to 8 instead of going to 10 or 11 rather. Anyways, I can end my turn and play the battle again and you can see that the number decreases. So if I were to attack this crab again, I would deal 9 damage, just like the tooltip shows us. But if I end my turn here, you can see that the effect expired and I do I only do 4 damage if I play this attack card. You can see that the block goes to 2, so I no longer do this increased damage I, I've dealt before. And another new card is this one. Uh, which says at the start of your turn gain two muscle. So this is a power card. This is the equivalent of demon form in Slay the Spire. So if I play this, I get this new status effect here. And if I click on this, it says true strength form at the start of its turn gains two muscle. Cool. So if I go ahead and end my turn here, I take seven damage, but I get this new muscle icon here and muscle is the equivalent of strength inside the spire so it says attacks deal two more damage and indeed this enemy has no status effects applied but if i hover over my attack card it says deal eight damage instead of the base six damage because i have two muscle and again if my and my turn at the start of every turn, I gain this two muscle. So this card, which deals four damage by default, goes up to eight by now. So if I can just block this turn and scale up with my strength. So this basic attack card deals double damage now. So instead of six, it deals 12. And indeed, it one shots the enemy. Cool. So I actually lost the run I was showing you earlier. So I started a new one. You can see here. That's a new path, but I wanted to show you the campfire as our next feature. So if I click on this heart icon here, you can see that I have 21 HP currently and the campfire heals you for 30% of your max HP. So if I click on the rest, you can see that I go up to 32 and I can continue with my path here. So I hit the shop again. And another cool feature I wanted to show you is this relic, which is called coupons. And it says that all items in the shop are discounted by 50%. So you can see that I have enough gold now to buy this. And if I click on buy, you can see that all the items get updated and have a 50% discount. But I still can't buy anything else. I just wanted to show you how this relic works because it's quite different from the other relics which affect the combat gameplay or the battle gameplay. And this relic is always applied. So if I were to go to another shop later on this run, the discount would still apply as long as we have the relic here. So I died again, but I was finally able to make it through the treasure room. So I can show you how this works. So if we go to this treasure room, you can see that we have this pulsating chest here. And if I click on it, it opens up and we get this new relic here barrel and if I click on it a new relic gets added to my relic handler 
And we can see that what it does is it damages all enemies at the start of your turn. Cool. So we can continue onwards. And I finally made it all the way to the boss fight. You can see that I had some more gold, so I bought a few new relics. One of them gets you block at the end of your turn. And the other one is at the start of combat, gain one extra mana. So you can go ahead and play the boss fight now. You can see that we have this ghost guy right here. And also what I wanted to show you is that cards can exhaust now and powers behave the same way as they do in State Aspire. So if I play this muscle scaling power thing, it costs me three mana, but you can see that it, it doesn't get added to our discard pile here. It's still a part of the deck, right? So I can use it every battle, but it doesn't get reshuffled into our deck ever. So we have nine plus three, equals 12 cards in total and it checks out because our deck is existing of 13 cards cool so let's see what this ghost does it has this action which is a hammer and this little poison bottle icon and also it buffed itself to have two muscle here so let's see what happens i play this exposed card so this ghost has two statuses the muscle which buffs him and the exposed which makes the ghost take more damage. Also, um, this blue card is not a power, it's an attack, right? It makes it exposed and deals damage, but this exhausts. So that's an, also a new feature added, because if we take a look at my discard pile, we only have one of those cards here. But in our deck, we have two of those cards, right? So I only played one of them, and that one got exhausted. It's not in my draw pile here and also not in my discard pile. Cool, so let's gain some block and let's see what this ghost does with this attack. So if I end my turn here, I take two damage, but what also happened is, remember I only had five cards in my draw pile, but this new card get added to my deck, which costs one to play, it exhausts and it slows you down. It's like, it's similar to Slimed in State Aspire, so it's like a status card which pollutes your deck and slows you down. So this is what this ghost does. It either buffs itself or attacks and adds this card to your draw pile. So let's see. Okay, so with my scaling and vulnerability, I was able to defeat the ghost. If I click on awesome, we have this victory screen because the run is over and we won and we can go back to the main menu. And that's probably all the new features we have. I hope you're excited. So let's move on to the architecture overview part and let's see how we can build this. So what are the requirements for this course? Well, I highly recommend checking out season one on the channel because we sort of expand upon the foundation we have built by the end of season one. Although it's not strictly necessary because I will provide a starter project on GitHub. So have it your way, but it's on the channel. Please check it out if you haven't seen it. Let's talk numbers next. So in season one, we had 47 scripts, over a thousand lines of code with white spaces and new lines included. And the longest of those scripts were just over a hundred lines of code. Well, we ramp up those numbers quite a lot in season two. We'll have over a hundred scripts, over 4,000 lines of code with white spaces and new lines included again. And the longest of those scripts will be the map generator with just over 200 lines of code, which is quite a lot, uh, doubled in size, but I still think it's reasonable. Our code is still modular, flexible, and all that good stuff we talked about. It's just a bit longer, but don't worry, I've broken it up into smaller functions to make it more digestible. So let's move on to architecture next. This is the very top level view of the project. We have the main menu, the character selector and the run scene. So we can start a run in two different ways, directly from the main menu when we load the current run we have or through the character selector when we want to start a new run. So we go to the character selector in this case, select the warrior, the assassin or the wizard and start a new run. We generate a new map, fill up our deck with the cards and all that stuff we need to do. As you can see, the run scene is kind of the brain of the operation, right? It's a very central piece of the puzzle. So let's see how this run scene looks like. This run scene is connected to 
most of the features we have in the game. First of all, it has a card pile view because we can view our current deck at any point of the game. Then it has a relic handler because relics are also quite an important piece of the puzzle and can connect into multiple different systems in complicated or complex ways. We also have the map, which is always present when we are in a run. And next we have a couple of different scenes, or as I call them, views, which we can switch between depending on the current place we are in this map. So we can either go to a battle, go to a treasure room, go to the battle rewards screen, go to a campfire, or go to a shop. These ones are usually separated from each other, and only one of them is active at a time. So it's the run's responsibility to always display the one we want to have currently, based on where we click on the map, right? So this is how the run looks like. And let's see some of the more interesting new pieces here, which are added. Let's start with the map. So how does the map look like? The map has a map generator attached to it, which relies on a data container called a room. So let's go from the bottom up here. The room is a data container, a resource, which has two kinds of data attached to it. It has gameplay related data, for example, the room's type, which can be a boss room, a battle room, a treasure room, a campfire room, and so on, and also has map or graph related data, which is more concerned with the positioning on the grid in the map, right? Which floor are we on? Or was this room already selected? Things like that. The map generator generates this grid procedurally, and it has a lot of constants, which are tweakable to your own liking, as you'll see when we implement this. And all the data this map generator produces is a dependency for the map itself, right? So the map's responsibility here is to take this data we have from the map generator and convert it into a visual and also interactable representation. It also handles a lot of logic, like unlocking new rooms as we move on and things like that. It also needs to signal up to this central run scene when we pick the room so it can switch to the corresponding scene, either the shop or the campfire or whatever. So the map also has some other pieces here, like the map room, which also relies on this room data container, but it's more like a visual representation, right? It's an icon which you can click on it has an animation when you highlight it and things like that. We'll also have a camera attached to this map so we can use the mouse wheel to scroll up and down like you saw on the demo. And we'll also have this visuals node where we can attach the map rooms and also the connecting lines between the rooms. So let's talk about relics next, which are probably the biggest pain point of this whole project. Why? because they are complex and they interact with a lot of different systems in the game. So we have this relic handler, which is responsible for adding new relics, removing relics, and also activating relics when we need to. So which other scenes or systems are dependent on relics? First of all, the run, the very central scene, is of course dependent on the relics. Why? Because we can view our relics we have at any given time in the run. This is why you can find them in this new top bar we have. And also we need to be able to save and load our relics if we want to continue our previous run. The next thing is battle rewards and treasure rooms, because they are a way to get new relics, right? So we need to be able to access the relic handler to A, generate or pick a new random relic we can get and B, actually add it to our current relics we have. We also have the battle scene, which is very, very dependent on relics, because most relics kind of do their thing during a battle, either at the start of a turn, at the end of a turn, the start of the combat, or the end of the combat, and all the other kind of relics we can have or you can think about. Also, these relics kind of modify the flow of this combat, or the battle itself, which we'll talk about in a second. Last but not least, shops are dependent on relics too, because we can buy relics at the shop, 
And also there's a special relic called coupons, which gives discount to all the other shop items. Speaking of battle scene modifications, let's see what's new here. So first of all, player and enemies now both have two new scenes attached to them. One is called the modifier handler and the other one is called the status handler. Both of those are needed so we can have all the new stuff working like status effects, powers, relics, etc. Why are those two separated into two different scenes? Well, we'll talk about the specifics when we implement this feature, but let's just say that sort of abstracting this modifier to its own scene helps us a lot with the reusability. So we can add new modifiers from relics, we can add new modifiers from status effects, and we can also add new modifiers from cards. So it makes it much more flexible. But again, we'll talk about this in detail later. Another new thing is we have two new card pile views attached to the battles, so the player can view their discard pile or draw pile at any given time during combat. So I was contemplating to use a queue for the relic system and to manage the battle's flow, but turns out there's a much simpler solution recommended by some of my viewers, so I ended up doing something much simpler, I think. So first of all, we kind of ease into the battle and this is where the start of combat relics get activated. And this only happens once at the beginning of the combat. Then we enter into a cycle, right? A loop. So the first part of this loop is to execute or activate the start of turn relics, followed by the start of turn statuses of the player. When both of those are finished, the player gets to do their turn by playing the cards and so on. Then, kind of in a reverse order, we activate the end of turn relics, then the end of turn statuses, and we start to discard our hand, right? And when the hand is discarded, that's the point where the enemy's turn starts, right? So first of all, we execute the start of turn statuses for the current enemy, then the current enemy does its action, then we execute the end of turn statuses for that enemy and we repeat those three as long as we have an enemy who hasn't acted yet. And when all the alive enemies are done, that's when we close the loop and loop back to the start of turn relics of the player. And when does this loop end? Well, when we resolve the battle. We can resolve the battle in two different ways by dying and going to a game over state, or killing all the enemies and winning the battle. So this is a lot more complex than it was before, but I hope that it still makes sense. I will refer back to this image a lot when we implement the new features. So the last thing we talked about in Season 1's architecture overview is all the data we have for the project. Here, I didn't want to go into that much detail with the data, because there's too much to unpack at once. If you think about it, we have almost four times as code as we had before, which implies that we have a lot of new stuff to store. But that doesn't mean I won't explain how we store them or why do we need that specific data container or resource. I just explain them when we need it, when we start implementing a specific feature. So that's it for the architecture overview for now. If you like my content, please consider checking out my coffee page where you can donate one time or become a member and get early access to all my content and videos. So the final thing I wanted to show in this video is how to get started if you want to follow along with the coding in the next videos. So the first thing you need to do is to navigate to the GitHub page of the project, link in the description. Then you can see that this project now has four different branches and if you click on this branches icon here, you can see what those branches are. We have the main branch, which is the current latest version, and we have three other branches, the season one starter, the season two starter, and the season one code branch. The season one code branch is the end result, which you end up with if you follow along season one. Here we need the season two starter project. So click on this branch, go to code and download zip. This will download the whole project as a zip file, which you need to extract, and add as a Godot project, just like we did in Season 1. Please note that I've upgraded this project to Godot 4.2 to make sure that we use the latest version. Also, if you want to um, use your own project you have from Season 1, 
the only thing you need to do is to copy this art folder from this code you downloaded because we have some new images and sound effects compared to season one. Also, I, I changed some of the code which we ended up with in season one to accommodate the GD script changes which the 4.2 version has, but I will go into detail with that when we actually start implementing new features and start coding the project. So for now, that's all from me and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.